I'm here at the Welcome Collection with the British Kenyan artist Grace Ndiritu, whose practice spans film, textiles, painting, books, performance and social practice. Grace has had a busy week, having just won the 2022 Film London Jarman Award and now opened a new show here called The Healing Pavilion. What was the idea behind the exhibition and who or what is being healed? The idea for the exhibition, it comes from a body of work called Healing the Museum that I began in 2012. This is because I felt institutions were out of sync with what was going on in society and I felt that we need to have a look and reflect on um, museum collections, how museums are set up and how we actually value objects. So the Healing Pavilion is kind of a, a look at that. Can you talk a little bit about the two large scale photos that you've turned into tapestries um, and what made you choose those two? Yeah, so the Healing Pavilion consists of an architectural space uh, which is designed like a Zen temple for people to come and contemplate uh, two tapestries. The two tapestries, one is from 1915 and is from an image um, from that time, uh, from the Welcome Collection, and it uses museum workers who, after work, have decided to take their own photograph, posing with ethnographic objects. Then the other tapestry uses an image from 1973 from the Ethnographic Museum in Berlin. And uh, that one was a, <laughs> a selfie, you could say, from that period of time. Um, it has much more of a comical, uh, dark sense of humour. Again, museum workers are posing after work with ethnographic objects. The two tapestries are titled Repair and Restitution. What impact would you like these works to have on visitors, ideally? I mean, repair and restitution are in conversation with each other. As I say, um, there are two sides of the same coin, and you, b you need both processes to happen. So repair can be actually an individual process where you um, come to terms with the past. And restitution can be a legal process, which can happen. And now most museums um, that have ethnographic collections are thinking about that. And um, for me, um, I've been working on um, issues to do with restitutions for a number of years. Um, most uh, famously, I was in this project that the Goethe um, Foundation sponsored, and it was a project where um, the people from who wrote the Macron report, Benedict Savoy um, and her colleague, um, they were part of it. And then other African and European museum directors, activists, artists, scientists, and um, we would come together and close workshops across Europe. So in the African Museum in Belgium, the Ethnographic Museum in Barcelona, in Turin, uh, in Bordeaux, and um, in many other countries. And the idea of that was to actually think about how restitution is going to work. Unfortunately, the British Museum did not take part in that. And so for me, the Healing Pavilion is a way to kind of provoke that discussion and bring it to the, the British public, because um, it's really important. Why are museums so significant as a forum for this action? I think because museums, you know, they hold our past, our collective past, and also they can hold our future. For, muse for me, museums are democratic institutions in the sense that they belong to us, you know, uh, all of us. And so we should use them and shape them the way that we want them to be shaped. Um, I don't believe in just decolonizing museums and getting rid and erasing the past uh, completely. I think it's much more about uh, transcending and transforming the past. Uh, so, for example, with the Healing Pavilion, I've actually taken uh, wooden panels from the Medicine Man Gallery, which is a controversial gallery at Welcome that used to have objects like human remains and different ethnographic objects. And it's actually on the same floor as the Healing Pavilion. And this is the last weekend that the Medicine Man will ever be open. So it's quite a historic moment so for this uh, exhibition to happen. 
So I've taken the panels imagined from the Medicine Man Gallery and then put them and built them into the structure of the healing pavilion. So not only aesthetically, but also energetically, um, this transformation and conversation can begin. What was it about the medium of tapestry that appealed particularly? Yeah, tapestry is obviously an ancient medium. Um, it's, a, it's a medium that has a sense of weight and heaviness. And I think, you know, obviously we're talking about the different colonial burdens and um, the heaviness of all of these collections. But that's kind of in contradiction and paradoxical to the images. So, for example, the 1973 image um, where the ethnographic workers um, from, sorry, the F, from the Ethnographic Museum in Berlin, they're much more casual. It looks like a Saturday morning TV show. Um, so it, having the weight of the tapestry, you know, it kind of contradicts it. But actually, that's important, you know, that those moments, um, because those photographs, both sets of photographs, but especially the Berlin one, was never really meant to be seen. It was actually taken and um, put on a roll of film and just hidden in an archive. And a researcher found it and then sent it to me. And then I was fascinated because I already had the welcome image. Uh, the welcome image is a well-known image um, that the collection have used before. And um, in the welcome image, all the people are dead uh, because it was taken in 1915. Whereas in the 1973 image, um, the people are still alive. And so what's important about that is then I was confronted with the fact of the fact that they're alive, that in Germany there is the issue of data protection and the fact that these people in this image, they have the right to their own image. And that's because of what happened in the Second World War and uh, afterwards. So then we came to a point where if I wanted to use the image, then I would have to transform their faces. And so we spent a lot of time digitally altering the 1973 faces to, to protect the people in the image. But this was actually a very complex issue and became um, quite an institutional um, debate between Welcome and Gropersbau, who co-commissioned the tapestries and wanted the tapestries to be made and the Humboldt Forum, who didn't necessarily <laughs> want the uh, tapestries to be made, but um, they are always saying that they want to decolonise their collections and they own um, the ethnographic collections now. And for me, it was really important for both of these images to be seen uh, because it, they, they mark the changes or lack of change um, of what, what thinking was happening in museums in the 20th century and leading up to now. Um, because the project really is about how did we get to where we are today. So the fact that actually from 1915 to 1973, you've got this same attitude towards the collection and the artefacts. Exactly, there isn't really a change in, in the sense of there's a change in the dress and maybe the 1915 image, um, the welcome workers are much more stiff and much more proud of the ethnographic objects and let's say more possessive. Workers in the 1973 are much more casual and laid back on um, the objects. In fact, one of them um, is actually sitting on the throne. Uh, this is a throne uh, from a king in Cameroon that was given to um, the Germans in a di as a diplomatic gift, uh, well, diplomatic gift, at some point during the colonial era. And um, yeah, the 1973 image that is kind of like um, a disregard for actually, and lack of respect, you could say, with the images. But I would say um, both portraits, I'm not really interested in the individuals in the portraits. I see them just as signifiers um, for actually a general attitude. And because I'm sure there's lots of hidden images um, in museums all over Europe and probably North America with the same sort of kind of selfies after work. Uh, so, um, yeah, like I say, it's not really about the individuals. It's really about showing what we were thinking um, as humans about um, ethnographic uh, objects at the time. And you've, you've framed both tapestries in different colours. Yeah, the different borders signify different things. Uh, for repair, 
um, the border is uh, yellow and uh, this has positive and negative uh, signifiers. So the positive is kind of a sunshine, uh, positive feeling and the negative is a type of toxicity uh, feeling. And then uh, the pink um, is actually, pink kind of signifies for the 1973 image an idea of openness and maybe passiveness, whereas um, the negative association is actually to do with the Third Reich and the fact that the Nazis used to use pink triangles to identify who, who and who was not her homosexual. So this is also already in the German history of identifying people. So I think it's important, you know, when you're talking about different colour symbologies, um, colour has always been key in certain times in history. There's also an audio element to this show, isn't there? Yeah, the audio guide is a really important element because it allows people to slow down and contemplate uh, the images on the tapestries. So basically I've recorded several meditations which tell you how to do certain breathing exercises and to slow down, but also give you art historical information about each tapestry and about the pavilion itself. The pavilion I see as a kind of creating a safe space within the museum to talk and discuss um, difficult issues. And um, yeah, for me, it's, it's an important place uh, that people feel as a refuge within the city as well. So they can come here for free um, up until the end of next April. And yeah, that, I think that's a key uh, factor. As you enter the pavilion, find a comfortable seat and close your eyes. Now focus on the area just below the nostrils and above the upper lip. Focus on the natural breath coming in and coming out. Do not change the breath, just close your eyes. If the breath is long, let it be long. And if the breath is short, let it be short. Let the breath be naturally, whatever it is, as we stay here for a few moments in silence. You've been interested in esoteric spiritual practices, especially shamanism, since you were quite young. What draws you to these practices? Um, I guess because my family, I grew up in rural Kenya and also working class Birmingham. And in rural Kenya, I saw a lot of wild animals as a small child. So this feeling of being very connected uh, to nature and the cosmos, it, it, I mean, it was just a very natural thing. Um, so that's really integrated into who I was uh, as a child and then later as an adult I decided to train formally with different teachers and different shamans and gurus and uh, going on meditation retreats but also living off-grid in different communities. Yeah, in 2012 you went totally off-grid didn't you and I wondered where you went and what were some of the most important things you learned from that experience because it was about six years wasn't it? Yeah I mean before 2012 I'd already spent some time being in community so I'd already done some woofing living on a yoga farm in New Zealand I'd been to Burning Man by myself in 2005 so I'd already spent quite a bit of time dipping in and out of communities um, but then in 2012, I made a decision to only go to the city when it was necessary. Otherwise, I'd always live in rural places or off grid. And so, yeah, it was an adventure where I would spend time living in monasteries, um, different Buddhist monasteries. I also lived in permaculture communities, hippie communities, in a van, in a forest, and also with the Hare Krishnas, which was a very intense. <laughs> experience and I wouldn't recommend that one to anyone. Things are changing slowly but many people still have prejudices around what they would see as sort of new age hippie stuff. How do you overcome these kind of obstacles? 
Well, I guess because I've been doing it for so long and it's just really a natural part of my life. I mean, I feel like my life and my art are very integrated. If you look on my website, I have two CVs, a spiritual CV and an uh, art CV. And if you follow the trajectories of both, they, you know, they chart the last 20 years of my growth as a person and as an artist uh, perfectly. And I did that. I decided to put a spiritual CV on my website to kind of externalise and formalise all these things I've been doing. But in my actual life, they're, yeah, they're totally integrated. Um, yeah, when I was young, it was difficult because I did get a bit of bullying and getting picked on when I was at art school because people didn't meditate then. So they would be like, why are you meditating? What, what, is, what are you doing? But now, I mean, most students in art schools have meditated or tried yoga. And especially since the pandemic, there's been a huge shift uh, towards of thinking differently about consciousness. And so I guess now I'm seen as some sort of expert because I've been doing it for so long. So, yeah, people ask me to do different events or exhibitions or panels um, about this topic. How much power does art have to change society in your view and how we see the world? I mean, I think that art definitely has the power to change uh, the way we view each other and view the world. I mean, I'm a, I grew up in an activist household. My mother, um, her and her friends, they set up a group called Women in the Third World. And they were very focused on anti-apartheid movement. And so I grew up going to marches. And also then she trained at the Truth and Reconciliation Studies um, when I was 10. So for me, it's quite a normal conversation, this idea of humanitarianism. Uh, but then at art school, I always felt very guilty because people were not obviously, at that time, they had no political awareness. So I was always thinking, what am I doing there? Even though I was studying textiles, I thought, oh, I should be in Palestine or, you know, doing something practical. Um, but then um, I went to see the Dalai Lama give teachings, I think in 2000 or 2001. And he talked about this idea of socially benefiting activities. And so then I thought maybe art could be associated benefiting activities, but the key was how to do it without it becoming cliche or dogmatic. Um, and yeah, so I've tried to come up with ideas and concepts and, you know, aesthetics and visuals where I think I can talk about quite difficult subjects, but in a playful way or in a new way. And that's what I'm trying to do here at the Healing Pavilion and in other parts of my work. Are there encouraging signs that museums are starting to heal? I mean, I think in, in, it's weird, like with institutions, I wrote um, an essay in 2016 called he Healing the Museum, um, because after, by then I'd done um, my Healing the Museum project for about four years, and I'd and on purposely tried to bring different audiences and different energies into museums by doing things like shamanic performances or holistic reading rooms where I would teach people meditation. Um, and I would work with different groups of people, so whether they were refugees or migrants um, or people who worked at the UN or, or NATO or the Parliament, EU Parliament. So for me, I've seen a change in different sectors I mean, when you look at an institution uh, or a museum as a whole, you may not see all the changes, but my belief it's like, um, you, you, it's kind of like a virus. You've got to get to some individuals who then can influence their colleagues. And that happened with my project, A Meal for My Ancestors, in 2018, when I worked with staff members from those agencies. Um, I had someone from the terrorist department, someone from the foreign office, um, I had a guy from NATO, I had a High Court judge from Lille, and they signed up to the project for four months um, where I would give them free creative visualisation classes. And then I worked with um, migrants and refugees and activists and I gave them free meditation classes for four months. And then I brought the two groups of people together and we did a shamanic performance. And some amazing things came out of that. Uh, for example, the woman from the Foreign Office she had a vision about climate refugees during her shamanic performance. And so she was so moved and touched that she decided to write a paper. 
and uh, start a think tank at the EU Parliament about changing the law around uh, climate refugees. And th for me, that was a moment where I saw the synthesis of something um, spiritual, esoteric, performative, artistic, and something practical coming together. And yeah, I was proud of that moment. That's fantastic. So after years when people didn't take your work around spirituality and art seriously, it feels like now you're on a roll. What projects have you got coming up? Coming up soon, um, I will have uh, two um, big shows actually in Belgium. One of them is at the SMAC in Ghent, where I've been doing uh, the Artists in Residency pro programme. Um, and I'm also having a mid-career survey. Um, it's called Healing the Museum. And it's actually great because I'll be showing films, I'll be showing parts of social practice, I'll be showing objects, but I'll also be showing all the work I've been doing for the last year, being with the staff, being with the objects, and uh, being with the energy in that building. So that's like the ultimate form of um, healing the museum, is to become a museum member of staff, and then actually um, look in the museum inside out. Uh, the Smack Show opens on the 31st of March and what's great, I will have already opened a show at the Photography Museum in Antwerp where I'm curating um, 500 square metres there in the collections department using 200 photographs, including my own photographs and I've designed a whole new sonography and the idea is looking at photography in terms of expandedness so using painting and textiles and interior design and uh, that show opens on the 16th of February, so people can visit both shows next spring.